envy and attempted murder. Verses 10 through 12. And he can't read his writing. Verses 13 through 16. He behaved wisely. And then I can't read the rest. Verses 13 through 16. <laughs> That's the reason I typed mine. <laughs> I'd have the same problem. <laughs> I've got four points. Number one, David and Saul's house. Verses 1 through 5. Number two, David gets women's honor. Verses 6 through 9. Verses 10 through 12, David receives Saul's hatred. And then the last one, David earns Israel's homage. That's verses 13 through 16. So I played on the H's. We have a house, honor, hatred, and uh, the homage of the Israelites. Uh, let's go on and let's start the questions. If not, uh, the bell will ring pretty quickly and we won't get through all of these. Uh, after David spoke with Saul, whose soul was knit with the soul of David? Yes, Jonathan's. And it came to pass... When he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Who is Jonathan? Saul's son. Now guys, in normal affairs, uh, Jonathan would be second in line for what? For the kingdom. Okay, so not only uh, is he Saul's son, he would be the one who's supposed to be second in line for the kingdom. And now he and David's souls are knit together one with another. What's that little word knit mean? What is it? Fused, that's one. What did you say? Meshed, that's another. What is it? Sewn together, okay, good. To bind, okay. Strong says this. To tie mentally, um, to, to love, to be in league with. It's translated also, bind up, join together. Brown Driver and Briggs says to bind, tie, bind together, league together, to bind fast. Um, do you think Jonathan and David knew one another before the battle of Goliath? We don't know, do we? They could have known one another a little bit, okay? Uh, according to earlier chapters, David had already been brought into the house of Saul to do what? To play the instrument, play the harp, uh, when Saul had that evil spirit come upon him. And so uh, there may have been, you know, a little association. Maybe he knew that this is the harp player. Uh, we really don't know, do we? But what I find interesting is this one huge event brings these two men closely together. Um, we were at a restaurant yesterday and uh, we were talking to the people that were uh, behind us in line and uh, they said the reason they were here is because they uh, came down about five years ago and uh, met some people and became friends with them and now every President's Day they come into town and go out to eat lunch with them. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot, and all of a sudden you find a friendship. And uh, Jonathan was very impressed with David, was he not? Because David had slain Goliath. And so now their souls are bound together. And I mean, uh, not just a little bit, but tightly wrapped together. Turn over to Genesis 4430 for just a minute. Before we leave this point. Genesis 4430 show you something. How many sons did Jacob have through Rachel? Two. Who were they? Yes, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph gets taken away, right? And later on she has Benjamin. True or false? Jacob loved Benjamin. I mean deeply, especially since Joseph had been taken away from him. Okay? Uh, the brothers have gone to Egypt and, um, um, you know, they, they want, he, want, he wants Benjamin brought, doesn't he? Pharaoh does. And the sons make this statement, Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, 
and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. That little word bound up, that's how close Jacob was with who? With Benjamin, okay? He was bound up. In the life of that son. So uh, a very, very close relationship. One man made this statement. Friendship is an entire sameness and one soul. A friend is another self. That's pretty, that's pretty sharp, isn't it? Okay. And if you've had a friendship like that over your lifetime, you've been very fortunate. You know that. They say very, very close friends, maybe two, three, four, during the course of an entire lifetime where you're really this close to one another, where that other person is almost a reflection of you. Okay, uh, And that's the way Jonathan and David were. How did Jonathan love David? Yes, he loved him as his own soul. 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. Um, here's something interesting. How are we to love our neighbors? Did you get that? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Folks, what we have in Jonathan and David is an example for us loving others. Got that? Jonathan loved David how? As his own soul. Now you and I are to love one another as our own self. Wow. You see, we can learn a lot through Jonathan and David's friendship because we have an obligation to love others in the same way. True or false? Saul took David and would not let him go to his father's house. That's true, true. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. What did Jonathan and David make together because Jonathan loved him so? Yes, a covenant with one another. And I wanted you to look up that word covenant. What does it mean? A promise. Okay, anybody else? A pact. A compact. Yeah, uh, Strong says that it literally means a cutting. Okay, uh, oftentimes uh, all covenants were sealed with a sacrifice. Okay, so there would have been a cutting, you know, of an animal's neck. Uh, in order to, uh, you know, seal the covenant between those two individuals, a compact, an alliance, a pledge, uh, very, very, uh, um, it just showed that, you know, not only uh, are we saying we're friends, we're, we're proving it through a symbolic act, okay? How have individuals done it in the past? Yeah, blood brothers, you know, uh, especially boys, you know, they thought it's a big thing. You know, you cut your finger or something and you rub it together. Oh, we're friends forever now, you know. And about a week later, you're fighting each other and all that stuff. But um, that used to be what some did. What five things did Jonathan give to David? Number one, okay, his robe. Number two, his garments. Number three, okay, his sword. Number four. His bow, number five, his girdle. Folks, garments were oftentimes interchanged between individuals who were friends. Okay, so we have a robe and we have his garments, right? But then we have what? A sword. And what else? A bow. Folks, weapons were traded between warriors who were friends. Okay, you know, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty good gesture to give somebody your weapon, isn't it? You know, it'd almost be like me taking my favorite Bible and handing it to a young preacher. You know, that here, take my Bible. Wow, you know, uh, that, that's a pretty big gesture, isn't it? Well, here's the king's son handing this young shepherd lad his sword and his what? And his bow. Now remember, this is the king's who? The king's son, remember, the king doesn't get junk, neither does his son. Wouldn't you like to have had that sword? Boy, I'm telling you. And so, uh, you know, this is a token of friends and a token of warriors who are friends. Okay? Uh, very powerful men in the nation of Israel now. Uh, when Saul sent David out, how did David behave? Wisely. And David went out. Whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. Anybody look up the word wisely? Nobody. See, if I don't ask, you don't do. Okay. 
That's the reason I do ask you sometime for definitions, because if I don't, you won't. Okay, that little word wisely, Strong says to be circumspect, to have intelligence. Brown, Driver, and Briggs says prudent, have insight, circumspect, consider, ponder, give attention to, have comprehension. Folks, when David went to war, David did not go out as just this reckless individual in warfare. Okay? The Bible says that when Saul sent him out, he behaved himself how? Wisely. He gave deep thought to the things that were done. How am I going to fight this battle? How are we going to arrange the troops? How are we going to bring this particular battle to victory for Israel? He behaved himself wisely in what he did. And guess how we need to behave ourselves? We need to behave ourselves wisely as well. You know, sometimes it's easy to go out there half-cocked, isn't it? And we just kind of shoot our mouths off or we just do things that are kind of crazy, folks. We got to be what? We got to think. We got to be wise people. And we got to do things in the proper way. Okay? What did Saul set David over? Oh, man. And Saul set him over. The men of war. Ever heard of a field commander? There's David. He set over the men of war, folks. Okay? Uh, he's going to be the one that's responsible for all, uh, all strategy on the battlefield. Where these men go, how many men go where, uh, how long they fight, where they fight. Uh, he, he's, you know, he's in a very, very uh, important position right now. The Bible says Saul had been gathering all of the valiant men of Israel to be his army. 1 Samuel 13, 2, 14, 52. Remember, anytime he saw a strong, strapping young man, what did he do? He recruited him, didn't he? One thing you didn't want to be is around Saul if you were a pretty strong fella. You know what? Because guess what you might not do? You might not go home. Right? Now wasn't that the prerogative of the king? Wasn't that one of the things that they had been warned about by Samuel? The king's going to take your sons. Folks, if he went into your town he saw your son and he thought he was worthy of the army, come on boy, just enlisted you. <laughs> <laughs> whether you wanted it or not. Okay, there was no volunteering a lot of times. What two groups accepted David? All the people and Saul's servants. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Could that be a dangerous thing for a king? Yeah. Yeah. For another individual to be just as respected and just as honored as the king himself, that could be a dangerous situation for a king if a man has a bad heart, right? Be very, very dangerous. Wow. When David and Saul returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, who came out to meet them? Yes, the women. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel. One of the roles that, well, there's numerous roles that women played, but oftentimes women were hired to be people who rejoiced at the time of victory. Okay, um, And they also hired women to cry at funerals. See, women can do that, you know. We men kind of look and go, he's gone. You know, but a woman, boy, she can pour on the tears, you know, and just boo-hoo, you know. And guess what else they can do? They can just, ooh, woo, boy, yeah, you know, uh, when it's victory time. And so they would hire groups of women to do these kind of things uh, in Israel. And so now we have this group of women who come out. Uh, who might these women also have been? Yeah, the wives and the daughters and uh, the children of these men who had come back from warfare. It's always a happy time when your army comes back uh, to you know, the cities uh, and, and have been victorious. So uh, uh, a lot of different uh, plays here. Who was going to say something? Anybody? I thought I heard somebody. Nothing? You were, but Bill said no. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. They're going to be tickled to death, aren't they? And just to know that he's back and alive, right? You know, especially if it's your son or something. So, uh, um, true or false? They met Saul and David with sorrow and crying and tears. No. Singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. Wow. Uh, in my notes, I give a rather lengthy quote from uh, Clark on these instruments of music. And uh, maybe you can go back sometime and you can uh, read about that. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his blank. Thousands. And David his ten thousands. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Guys, when this army went out, we're not told how long they stayed out on the battlefield. Okay. Who, who had they gone to war against? The Philistines. Okay. And it may have been that they had stayed out on the battlefield for weeks, possibly even months, before they actually come back to their hometown. Okay. So there could be uh, quite a bit of time that's passed before they actually get back and rejoice uh, over uh, the battle and everything. Let me ask you this. When battles were going on, was there communication between family and those at the battlefield? We've already got proof that there was. David's dad had sent him to find out how the battle was going and he was supposed to bring him back pledges of his son to make certain everything was okay. This was a common practice because they'd be gone a while. Okay. Well, individuals would find out how things went. Oh, they're winning the battle, or oh, they're losing the battle, or oh, this one is dead, or whatever, and the news would come back. Well, these individuals had already received word that what? They'd been successful in the battle, that David had beat Goliath, and apparently that David was what? A good warrior, and had killed thousands of Philistines. Okay. And so they come back into town. The women rejoice. They're praising everyone. Saul has slain his what? Thousands. But David, his hundreds. No, his tens, thousands. Wow. Unreal. How did Saul respond to the saying of the women? Yes, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. Man, here's a question for you. Be honest with me. Is it easy to get set off by one statement? Yeah. You know, there's sometimes all a person has to say is one sentence, and guess what? You explode, don't you? Not, none of us can, you know, we, we can't feel that way Saul felt, can we? You know, that's never happened to us. <laughs> Just getting a marriage relationship. Right? You know, sometimes just one, like you say, one word, you know, one sentence. Bam! All of a sudden. Well, here Saul was. You know, can you imagine? Everything's fine. He's victorious. He's the leader of the nation. And yet now he hears this statement exalting this little shepherd boy over the king. And he was very wroth. And the saying displeased him. What does it mean to be wroth? Angry. Intensely angry. Yeah, it says very wroth. Should have been. Should have been. Yeah, he done messed up. You know, and now who's getting the praise? You know, absolutely. Um, to glow, to be warm, to blaze up of anger, jealousy. To be hot, furious, burn, become angry, to be kindled. Folks, here's a man who is steaming mad. Okay? He's not just a little mad. He's very raw. And displeased. That little word displeased means to be broken up, 
to fear, to tremble, to quiver. Okay? Um, let me ask you something. When, um, when the shepherds came into the city of Jerusalem and they were looking for the Christ, the Messiah, to be born, uh, did that bring any concern to a king? Yeah. Who was it? Yes, Herod. Remember? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? King. One word. If they just said, where's that little boy that was born? Nothing would. But where is he that is born king of the Jews? And guess what? Herod feared. So much so that what does he try to do? Yeah, he's going to try to destroy that king. One word. King versus king. Well, now we've got a man that's in a more powerful position than Saul, right? And not only is he wroth, but he also is trembling with fear. They recognize this man as being what? More powerful than I am. And he trembled and he shook because of what they had said. There you go. That's good. He said he he uh, they they gave homage to Saul because he was king, and you you're supposed to honor the king. But why David? Because he'd earned what had uh, been given unto him. One man makes this statement, Meyer. It was the refrain of the women's ode of victory that opened Saul's soul to the envenomed dart of jealousy. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? You know, the Bible says that Satan is constantly throwing what? Darts. Remember, we're supposed to have over our heart the what? The shield of faith, wherewith ye may be able to quench the fiery darts of Satan. Right? Saul didn't have his armor on, folks. The dart of jealousy was thrown, and guess what? It pierced him straight into his heart. And he will never be the same man with David. Never. Okay? Sad. What did Saul think David would desire after hearing this? Yes, the kingdom itself. And said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Now here's what's interesting. What has he done now to David? What has he done to David? Mm -mm. He's prejudged him. Hasn't he? He's prejudged. Has David said, I want the kingdom? David's never said that. Has David always been faithful to Saul? Yes. He's gone in and out. He's fought the, the Philistines and he's behaved himself wisely. He's never given any indication that he wants the kingdom. It's the words of the women who calls him now to prejudge this man and say what? Ah, now he'll want the kingdom. You see, it's so easy for us to judge the hearts of, or attempt to judge the hearts of others, and oftentimes, folks, our judgments are not true. You know that? Would David have ever taken the kingdom from Saul? No. Not, not even when he has a chance is he going to take the kingdom. But Saul believes this in his mind. You see what jealousy does to us? It's a dangerous sin, isn't it? Anybody have? Yes, ma'am. Sarah. Oh, yes. Does he know? No. Not, not so far. It was done at Saul's house. I mean, uh, Jesse's house. And he, he has no clue who the person is. He just knows I've been rejected. Possibly, you know. Yeah, uh, well, uh, right now everything's been pretty hidden, you know, uh, because uh, that, that was the whole thing Samuel said. If Saul knows, he'll kill me. Okay, and so he, uh, uh, they, they devised a way that Saul would not know what had transpired. So at this point, 
it, it appears that only uh, David and his family and Samuel knew that he'd been anointed. And, uh, but uh, David's making some inroads, like you say, that could... Uh, he knows he's been rejected, though. And you can assume... Yeah, oh yeah, you know, easily. Uh, <clears throat> One commentator took the words of the women to be just another mark of Saul's rejection by God. You know, wasn't another dart in his heart? You know, he's already been told flat out, you're rejected, hasn't he? And now here's another, you know, dart in his heart of these women. You've slain thousands, David ten thousands. Lesson. Folks, Saul would have been wise to have lifted David up before the people. Got that? That's what he'd been wise to do. Do you know what? Number one, he would have shown his humility, wouldn't he? Guys, so what if another shines brighter than me? Who cares? Does that, does that really bother you? To have somebody else that shines brighter than you do? If, if you've got that, you know, if, that, if that's your mentality, then you need to check your heart. David's a wonderful man. He's an unbelievable warrior. He, he beat Goliath. Guess what he should have been doing? He should have been riding on the king's horse into town. That would have shown humility on Saul's part, wouldn't it? But also, David's heart was not one of rebellion, was it? He was a loyal servant. Just think of all the wonderful things he could have used David to do in his kingdom. If he just kept David, not as an adversary, but as a friend. There, guys, there, there were years that David's life is going to be wasted because of this jealousy on the part of this man. And, and there's no sense in it other than this man's got some problems. You know what? And it's sad uh, when, when those kind of things transpire. Notice... Question 19, and Saul blanked David from that day forward. I, David, man, to look at with jealousy, to I, to look at. Folks, let me tell you something. When your heart becomes so consumed with one person, you got a problem. You got that? When your heart is so consumed by one person, you've got the problem. And that's where... Saul is right now. He's consumed, isn't he? I'm going to eye David. I'm going to watch David. Now, would he be able to do it all by himself? No. So guess what? He had the power and he had the ability to do what? Get his servants to do things, right? Get, get his officers to do things. Um, there, there's another group of people in Scripture who eyed a man. Does anybody know who it was? Folks, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, guess who they eyed? Jesus. The Bible says, and they watched him. Can you imagine every day of your life you get up and you know that your enemy is watching you? They're watching you to mess up. They're watching to accuse you. They're watching to destroy you. They're watching to see what your weaknesses are. They're watching so that they can finally, finally put you to death if need be. Folks, if you ever find yourself being a part of a group like that, you need to check your heart and you need to get out of that. You know that? Something wrong. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That relationship, it's going it's to come up later, you know. Uh, some statements are going to be made uh, between those individuals, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something. Meyer says this, He eyed David from that day, not with affectionate admiration, but always with, a, with desire to place malicious construction on every act and word and look. It's kind of like Eliab was, wasn't he, with his brother? Remember that when he came to the battlefield? Goliath was a jealous man, was he not? I know why you're here. Got that old evil heart. You know, unreal. 
when we allow one person to consume us. The day after returning from battle, what came upon Saul? The evil spirit. What did Saul do in the midst of the house? He prophesied. Guys, sometime um, do a little study on, and he prophesied, and try to determine what that means, okay? Uh, it's just an interesting study. Um, some believe that the evil spirit and the prophesying are not related. Um, Saul was either uh, feigning to prophesy or he's involved in some type of personal devotion in his house. Okay, uh, That's just one, uh, one view uh, that I set out there. But go do some study on what it means that he prophesied in the midst of his house. What did David do at that time? Played the harp. And what did Saul have in his hand? A javelin. Uh-oh, here you go, right? I got an evil spirit in my heart. I got jealousy filling my heart. I got the guy that I'm jealous for playing for me. I got a javelin in my hand. This is a wonderful situation. <laughs> what did he do with the javelin? He threw it, didn't he? Folks, I put this down as a lesson. Saul is more than jealous. Okay? The step away from jealousy is envy. Okay? Proverbs 27, 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who can stand before envy? You see, envy desires the destruction of another person. Jealousy, I'm jealous over what you have. Okay? I'm just jealous of what you have. I want what you've got. But see... Not, envy not only says, I want what you've got, but guess what? I'll destroy you to get it. Who can stand before envy? Got to be careful when those kind of emotions come up in our heart. How many times did he try to kill David? Twice, and he avoided out of his presence twice. Why was Saul afraid of David? Ah, I love that, don't you? That's what the text says. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from who? From Saul. Man. Because of envy. You know how it is, you know. Well, he, he wasn't so much of his own son. See, but David... You know, but see, the problem was these two men were friends, and it's going to cause some friction uh, a little bit, okay? Um, God had departed from Saul. The words of Samuel, no answer from the Lord. Victory, not from Saul's hand, but by the hand of David. The words of the women. Oh, guys, there are so many evidences that God was no longer with this man. What position did Saul give to David? Yeah, captain over a thousand. Therefore, Saul removed him from him, and made him captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. Why did he get rid of him? Yeah, I don't want him in my house anymore, right? So he gave him another position. What do we try to do? We try to get rid of our problem, right? David's my problem, so I'm just going to get rid of him. Put him out there with the thousands, and I don't have to, you know, in his mind, do you think there may have been other reasons? Next chapter, <laughs> uh, we'll find that out, won't we? Okay. And David behaved himself blank in all his ways, and the blank was with him. Wisely, the Lord. Folks, here's a lesson. Okay. Regardless of how our enemy acts toward us, we stay faithful to God, and we do what we're supposed to do. Got that? Da David, David had a reason, did he not, to just behave in horrible ways if he wanted to. I'm not going to bring victory to this man. I'm in a position over a thousand now. Guess what I can do? I can set up the field of battle so that we lose to the enemy. And that'll show Saul. No. He behaved himself wisely. He stayed faithful. He stayed loyal. He stayed dedicated. He did exactly what he's supposed to do. You see, sometimes what do we do? We become foolish before our enemies. Folks, don't become stupid and foolish. You continue to behave wisely. 
how did Saul react when he behaved himself wisely? He was afraid, wasn't he? That's what the Bible says. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. You see, we do what we're supposed to do, and we strike terror into the hearts of our enemies. Last question, who loved David because he went out and came in before them? The Bible says, And all Israel and Judah loved David because he came out and went in before them. Notice the distinction again. Israel and who? Judah. Folks, this is the second time in 1 Samuel that this division between Israel and Judah have been made. Okay? The division's coming. Okay? It's coming. Oh, absolutely. Had he wanted the kingdom, he could have taken it, couldn't he? Absolutely. Sure could. Uh, yeah, David should have, I mean, Saul should have exalted that man. Thank you. Y'all look hungry.